<laughs> All right, good evening. I'm glad you came out to Bible study tonight. To join us in our study of Revelation. We are getting toward the end, Revelation 18. It's our 28th lesson in the process of going through the book. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer, and we'll get into it. God, we love you. We thank you that we have the assurance of Jesus Christ's return, of his reign. We thank you that we have the assurance of resurrection to be with him for all those who put, your, put their faith in him. We pray that this study tonight might be an encouragement to us, a reminder of your hatred of sin and how we need to live our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Revelation 18. Uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ has been telling us of the coming collapse of the world and the preparation for Jesus to return and rule. The coming demise of Antichrist's world religion, government, and economic system has been referred to or overshadowed several times. We've, we've seen it talked about in the sixth seal back in Revelation 6, the seventh trumpet in Revelation 11, uh, the preview in Revelation 14, and the seventh bowl in Revelation 16. Uh, Cummings makes this statement. The details here correspond to the fighting, smiting of the feet of Nebuchadnezzar's great image depicting the times of the Gentiles by the uncut stone of Daniel 2, 33 to 35, and 41 to 45. If you remember the, this great image that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about, that was his kingdom followed by the other kingdoms. The last one, which was clay and stone. And then all of a sudden this giant stone destroyed it all. Oh, seems to be parallels here to that prophecy as well. But Babylon, last week we talked about the history of Babylon going back to Nimrod. Uh, the corruption there of trying to build a city and build a tower to God and how that religious system uh, has continued throughout the world in different ways, corrupted other beliefs. Um, so Babylon, though, as we look at it, is both a city and a system here. It seems to be in Revelation 18. And uh, Revelation 18 gives us the Antichrist kingdom as it will be in the end of uh, Babylon. We've previously learned in Revelation 13, 17, that his kingdom is uh, coming out of the revived Roman Empire. We saw that coming kingdom even back in Daniel. And a worldwide religious system will be part of that kingdom. It's another kingdom united in defiance of God the Creator. And we have that all over the world now. People living for themselves. So this system of unbelief that is there, but it's also a city. Seven times in Revelation 18, uh, verses 10, 16, 18, 19, and 21, uses the statement uh, city. Many commentators from many eras have different ideas as to where or what city Babylon is. Uh, many believe it to be Rome. It corresponds some to the seven hills back in Revelation 17. The fact that it's a religious center and the uh, Roman Catholic Church is a part of that, and some of the deal with the Roman Catholic Church, um, I think a lot of the commentators from the late 1800s, early 1900s, when the Roman Catholic Church was much more powerful all over, uh, believed that was gonna be part of it. I don't know that they have quite the influence today that they once did, but they have, plenty of influence still around the world. Um, a second belief based upon Revelation 11 and 16 is that it would be Jerusalem. The fact that the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple at Jerusalem in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4. It says, let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the following away comes first, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worshiped. So he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So he's going to set himself up there. So some say that's where 
Jerusalem as being called Babylon. Uh, others say it's an unnamed city. It's not a city that we're aware of yet that'll be called Babylon. Uh, this follows those who would say Babylon is more of a system than a place and the center of the Babylonianism has changed over the years. And the philosophy of Satan has moved the world government systems, who is in control and what is controlling what uh, has changed through the years. But uh, there's many that believe it's just literal Babylon. The main objection to this is that it was prophesied that Babylon would be destroyed and never inhabited. Yet there are some prophecies that have never been fulfilled about the destruction, so that it's possible it could be rebuilt and finally destroyed. Look at Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13 says, Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore all the hands will be limp, every man's heart will melt, and they will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will hold of them, take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both anger, with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark and it's going forth. The moon will not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. And then in verses 19 to 22, Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldean's pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation. Nor will the Arabian pinch tits, pitch tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there. But wild beasts of the desert will lie there, their houses will be full of owls, ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will caper there. The hyenas will howl in their citadels, jackals in their pleasant palaces. Her time is near to come, and her days will not be, long, be prolonged. And then over in Jeremiah chapter 50. I don't know that I'm going to read all of this because it is like 70 verses long. But uh, it goes on in verse chapter 51, verse 1. Behold, I raise up against Babylon, against those who dwell in Lebkamai, a destroying wind. I will send winnowers to Babylon, shall winnow her in an empty land in the day of gloom. They shall be against all her around. Um, it just goes on about the utter destruction. Verse 11, make arrows bright, gather the shields. The Lord has raised the spirit of the kings of the Medes. His plan is, to, is against Babylon, destroy it because of the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. Set up the standard of the walls of Babylon, make the guards strong, set up the watchmen, prepare the ambushes for the Lord has devised and done. He spoke against the inhabitants of Babylon. And you see, some of this was fulfilled, but there's other parts of this complete annihilation where nobody ever rebuilds, because we know that either on the site or right next to the site, there is a city of Babylon now that we saw Saddam Hussein rebuild. So has it been fulfilled that this is will never be uh, inhabited? That doesn't seem to be yet. After Darius was defeated, it later became a large, thriving city as part of the Medo-Persian Empire. Alexander the Great resided there in 323. Uh, Peter preached at Babylon. First, chapter, first Peter 5.13 says, She is, who is Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. So Peter was there. Uh, there's a city there now, or right next to it. But uh, even looking at it right now, which has been messed up from the, the war in the last 30 years. But uh, for it to become the economic center of world activity, a lot of great changes would have to take place there. That doesn't mean it can't quickly. Uh, we see other places change rapidly. Uh, but for it to be that, uh, unless it's all done because the computers connect everything today uh, and, and disconnect and disconnect <laughs> yeah, some people thought the world was going to come to an end yesterday when Facebook was down for six hours or Monday uh, 
their days were desolate. Two whistle blowers and trying to keep people accountable. Yeah, convenient. So, uh, but as we get to the chapter in Revelation 18, so many believe it's a city. That that would be the direction I I lean. Is that a, seems like that fits that it would be Babylon. Uh, God can work a lot of things out in, that, in doing that. Uh, but verses 1 and 2, it says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Uh, after this, in verse 1, reveals that this is a new vision, a new section of vision uh, from chapter 17. He, he's used those types of statements throughout the book of Revelation as things are divided up. And he sees here a great angel, and some would say, well, that's Jesus Christ, because this powerful and glorious angel that lights all, but the term that is used there for another angel is the group Greek word allos. Greek word allos means another of the same kind. The Greek word that means another of a different kind is heteros. If you remember uh, back in the book of John when Jesus said, I'm going to send another to you like myself, that was the term allos. The Holy Spirit is like Jesus Christ. He has the same power and uh, so it's another kind. So this would be an angel just like the one in chapter 17 of the same kind. He is said to have great authority to, to speak, to do. To, he's very powerful. And then he says uh, that his glory illuminates the earth. That's hard to imagine that this spirit being is giving light for us that have not seen anything like that. Uh, but what did the shepherds see? Angels in a bright light. Uh, when, when Jesus' birth announcement was made. And then uh, he has a mighty voice um, here in, the, in this verse. This mighty voice and the announcement that Babylon has fallen is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah 13.9. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. In Isaiah 21, and look, here comes a chariot of men with a pair of horsemen. Then he answered and said, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And all the carved images of her gods has broken to the ground. Jeremiah 51, Babylon has fallen, suddenly fallen, and been destroyed. Wail for her, take balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. Um, statement here that MacArthur makes. The description of desolation most approximates the portrait of Babylon and Edom's judgment in Isaiah 13 and 34. These judgments are viewed as anticipations of universal Babylon's judgment at the end of history. A final stripping away of Babylon's luxurious facade reveals her skeleton within, which sit on only demonic bird-like creatures. Jewish interpreted... interpreted... <laughs> Jewish interpretation of the creatures in Isaiah 13 and 34 understood them to be demonic. And as we look at this and read it, it says, the dwelling place of demons, a prison for a foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Uh, it's very depraved. The satanic influence is, is massive here. And that should not surprise us because as we've seen the curses that have come through the book of Revelation. If we remember the sixth trumpet in Revelation 9, uh, it says, the, heard the voice of four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had a trumpet, release the four angels who are bound to the great river Euphrates. So the angels who had prepared the hour and day and month were released to kill a third of mankind, now a third of the army, horsemen, 200 million. I heard them and the fifth trumpet. Uh, also, in, in, in 9, the fifth angel sounded, a star from the heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. 
He opened the bottom of the pit, and smoke arose out of the pit, the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came up of the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded to not to harm the grass or any green thing, but only men who don't have the seal. They were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Um, and then they're going to seek death. So you have these spirit beings. The commentator says, B -B Babylon will be a prison of e every unclean and hateful bird. Phrase symbolizes the city's total destruction like grotesque carrion birds. The demons will hover over the doomed city, doom city waiting for the fall. The depiction of demons as unclean and hateful reflects heaven's view of them. Uh, even as we read in Jeremiah, the, the wild animals inhabiting even the palaces. And you got these birds that eat leftovers inhabiting and coming. Um, again, that's hard for us to imagine. What, what it would take to, for this to happen, for this as we're going to see by the end of the chapter, happen very quickly and change. But they are a guilty city, verses 3 to 5. The nations have drunk of the wine of wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. I heard another voice out of heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, unless you receive her plagues. For her sins have reached the heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. They brought all the nations into their sin. That's what it's talking about. It says they drank the wine of her fornication. The kings of the earth have fornicated with her. The evil political liaisons come together from around the world. Uh, she's got powerful economic economy. It's driven by the merchants who become rich. And their commercial relationships have drawn others into that luxury. Sound familiar with the world interaction we have today? And... Uh, as we've seen the problems since COVID of keeping things flowing, you know, you see hundreds of ships sitting outside the ports on both coasts, not getting things delivered. That if you have somebody that can bring a worldwide peace so that all that conflict, even in the commerce, is gone, the competition is gone, think of how much they will be lauded. Um, in that process we saw the religious working together in chapter 17 now we see the economy working together uh, the sins of the city have been heaped up to heaven and God remembers her iniquities that is not a good thing that God remembers their sin and his wrath is going to come down on them uh, verse 23 D The end of it, uh, for by your sorcery the nations were deceived. There, there's satanic influence and power helping to deceive these nations. So when you think of one man being able to do it, it's not just them. It's the satanic influence, the sorcery. Um, as we talked about last week, the fake rising from the dead, the, the different things will take place. But Babylon was guilty of opposition to the Lord, as demonstrated by shedding the blood of prophets and saints. And this system was even uh, present when the apostles were alive. In verse 20, uh, O heaven, you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. They faced the opposition uh, of the world and their influence. Uh, verse 24, in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all who were slain in the earth. So Babylon does not like righteousness or those who speak for righteousness. So those who come to know Christ during this period uh, are going to be targets. And, and it will not be good, but yet God calls us to be faithful. And those who at that time will be called to be faithful. There's a call to separate in verse 4. People living here, that's believers or Jews, who were called to get out. This is during the tribulation time, I believe. Lot. Likewise, was called to get out of Sodom before the destruction came. Here they were called to get out. Uh, Jeremiah 50, 
in those days, in that time, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together with continual weeping, they shall come and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces toward us, saying, Come, let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that will not be forgotten. My people have lost their sheep. The shepherds led them astray. They have turned them on the mountains. They've gone from the mountain to hill. They've forgotten their resting place. All who found them have devoured them in their adversaries. We've not offended because they've sinned against the Lord, the inhabitation, the habitation of justice. The Lord, the hope of the fathers, move through the midst of Babylon, go out of the land of the Chaldeans, and be like the rams before the flocks. For behold, I will raise and cause to come up from Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country. They shall array themselves against her, for she shall be captured. Her arrows shall be like an expert warrior, none shall return in vain. And verse chapter 51 says, Flee from the midst of Everyone save his life. Don't be cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her. Verse 45, my people go out of the midst. Let everyone deliver himself from the fierce anger of the Lord. Uh, these challenges from Jeremiah, like many other prophecies, seem to have dual application. There, there's application there for the Babylonians as the Medes and Persians come in, and there's the complete, full application at the end of time here that corresponds with the book of Revelation. We saw that even with the uh, the dual application as a virgin shall conceive in Isaiah. There was a, a baby to be born there to the king there's, or, or to Isaiah. There's a the Jesus Christ was to come later as well. Dual uh, prophecy. These systems of Babylon, the world and their philosophies are present today. And we are challenged to come out from among them and be separate. 2 Corinthians 6 says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has a temple of God with idols? For you are a temple of living God. And God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them. Be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I, I think that is one aspect, the aspect of separation from the world that is being missed in much of modern American Christianity. Um, and many places, that there is no distinction. People want to be like the world too much, um, mimicking in many, many ways. And here it will be revealed they, they need to come out for their safety, but we need to come out for our righteousness, for our relationship with the Lord to not be influenced. How does man view this city as we look at several verses here? In verse 7, in the measure of that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously in the same measure, gives her torment and sorrow, and she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and no widow, and will see, not see sorrow. Um, she, she glorifies herself. That, that would be a concerning statement to anyone, I would think. We give ourselves credit, we glorify, we put ourselves up. Uh, we see a lot of that today, don't we? Not only in sports, but in politics, in churches, uh, it just goes on and on. She lives luxuriously. That's the idea is indulging extravagantly and sensually. It's not just monetarily. It involves the, the lust and intemperance, not living righteously. <coughs> it says, though she is in torment, she gives herself assurance. What kind of assurance is that then if she's in torment? It's a false assurance. She, she's given her false hope. Um, now, verses 12 and following, we see some of the things that demonstrate the wealth of Babylon as the world has come together and used her as a center of commerce and trading. It says, merchandise of gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, 
fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble. So precious metals and jewels are there. Clothing, uh, timber and lumber, some of the best it says. Uh, some of the craftsmen apparently using these natural resources with the precious wood, the bronze, iron, and marble. Um, some of the precious oils and other things used in medicine like the cinnamon, the incense, the fragrant oil, the frankincense. And then agricultural products like wine, oil, flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses. And then you've got whether it's considered transportation or protection where you say you have horses and chariots which a chariot in my mind would be more for protection but horses would be used for both protection carrying things uh, although they had other beasts of burden that they used as well but then the final thing there uh, bodies and souls of men slave labor they owned many and that has not or will own many that has not been unusual through the centuries uh, there and at one time Rome had thousands and thousands of slaves all over uh, here same Babylon will have as well uh, in Revelation chapter 6 it said I heard a voice in the midst of the four creatures saying a quart of wheat for a denarius Three quarts of barley for Daenerys. Do not harm the oil and the wine. Remember the cost of wheat was exorbitant. Cost of food. A day's wages for a day's food. But as the Antichrist takes over this one world government, provides for people, they become allegiant, and all they get all the wealth. Reminded me of Joseph. Remember the seven years of famine? Everybody came. Why do they find all the gold in all these Pharaoh's tombs? The whole world brought them their gold. They gave them corn and wheat because of the prophecies that Joseph interpreted, his management, which was maybe the first socialism in the new in the in the Bible if we acknowledge it and he provided for all but in the end everybody was the slaves of Egypt Egypt owned them and, and I think that's some of what we see going on here when, when this one world government is totally in control it owns everybody Cummings made a note here. He says, the list of commodities is significant. At the top is gold. At the bottom is souls. That is the exact opposite of God's value system. Um, but we see that today, don't we? Some of the products that make the most money for people, where are they produced? China? For for a, a Taiwan, a few cents an hour, yeah. for for many of them, and for a family to eat, children eight ten years old are working in these shops, providing the cacao for our chocolate bars. How would you say that? Cacao. The unrefined chocolate. There we go. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things there that we don't realize until somebody goes and does the research. But from the parts in our cars, our computers, there's just a lot of stuff, and maybe not as much the electronics as some of the other things. Uh, MacArthur, speaking of judgment, coming here, says, having thrown off any semblance of self-control or self-restraint, sinners will indulge in wild materialistic orgy like those in ancient Babylon they will be partying when their city is destroyed remember Belshazzar's feast bring me the gold cups from the temple and then 
the writing was on the wall. And, and it says, you know, when Christ returns, he's going to come as a thief. We saw that in Sunday morning. Um, but James 5 speaks of this, and multiple commentators pointed back to James 5 here. It says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries, which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you, and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the days that you've stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of labors has mowed your field, which has been withheld from you, cries out against you, and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. Instead of responding righteously to people's needs, you've partied. Think of the economy of the United States and the way many live. And even our politicians, the ones that will say, well, let the poor people come here. And the ones, many of them that speak the loudest have some of the most luxurious mansions and transportation out there uh, that is available and really are doing nothing for the poor. It's all lip service. Um, I'm going to get cut off my Facebook feed for saying stuff like that. Oh, yep. Broadcast failed. No. <laughs> it, it happened probably before that. But <laughs> it says broadcast failed. So you're going to have to watch later on. So that's funny. YouTube will shut us off next. But they live for entertainment. Uh, verse 22a. The sound of harpists, musicians, flautists, did I say that right? Trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman or any craft shall be found in you. So live entertainment seemed to be something with the music. Uh, music seems to be a factor. In Noah's day, uh, his brother, Genesis 4, brother's name was Jubal. His father was all those who played the harp and flute. And it was used in uh, B Babylon to control the masses. In Daniel 3, remember they command the people to come. When they played the horn, flute, hired, lyre, psaltery, and symphony, uh, they were to bow and worship Nebuchadnezzar. So music has been a part. But judgment is coming. And it's going to be complete. And it's going to be very deserved. Verse 6. Um, tells us that it is rendered to her as she rendered to you and repay her double according to works. Cups she's mixed makes double for her. So double destruction. The angel's prayer for justice is based upon Old Testament law. Uh, the law of retaliation, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a truth. Uh, Babylon was extended enough grace and heard enough warnings it's time for vengeance. There's other Old Testament principles as well that when people were caught taking things or destroying something, they were to restore, restore twofold. Here they're paying twofold price for their sin. Uh, the destruction is swift. Looking at verses 8, the plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine. Uh, verse 10, Alas, the great city of Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Verse 17, for in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Verse 19, they threw dust on the heads and cried weeping and wailing. Alas, that great city which is ships, the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she's made desolate. Um, say one hour to lose all your riches but remember how much of our economy is digital my first introduction to that was back in 1986 or 87 Black Tuesday was that November of 87 when uh, the stock market took a dive 
I had a relative who wanted to help us out, and I had about $2,000 at the time that had been invested with him, which was going to be college money. I was in college, and that happened, and he lost everything. I had to work more. <laughs> but uh, that was one day. People committing suicide because they go from being rich to nothing. And here we have a city that is destroyed in a day as Belshazzar's happened overnight. They, they came in and immediately. Uh, the destruction will be complete. Jeremiah 25, I send and take all the families of the north. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, I'll bring them against the land, against its inhabitants, against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them in astonishment, hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I'll take them from the voice of myrrh and voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sounds of the millstones, the light of the lamp. This whole land shall be desolation and astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Uh, very similar destruction is coming to Babylon itself. In verses 21 to 24, how many times do you notice the phrase no more or not anymore in those verses? I'm going to read them. You count them. Then the mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, threw it in the sea. Thus with violence the great city of Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. The sound of harpists, musicians, flautists, trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. The sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. The voice of the bridegroom bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, and for by sorcery all the nations were deceived. In her was found the blood of the prophets and saints, and all of them were slain in the earth. How many of those phrases? Seven. But either way, six or seven, there's a lot of them there. Uh, and all these things that are signs of life. The bride and the groom, uh, the grinding stone, which is making food, the music, which is a celebrating, uh, all these things is gone. In verses 9 through 19, it says, The kings of the earth will see and will mourn. How are the ways, or how many references to them uh, mourning do you, we find in verses 9 through 19? Read through there and see which ones you pick up. What's it say in verse 9? They'll weep and lament. lament when they see the smoke and are burning. Is there any in verse 10? Not seeing one there. Verse 11, the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn for no one buys their merchandise. Verse 15, is that the next one? The merchants of these things will become rich, will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. Verse 18, I think it's the next one. Cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what is like the great city? Verse 19, they threw dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by wealth, for in one hour she's made desolate. Um, these wealthy people who would have been leaders if they owned the ships and run these businesses are now beside themselves because their wealth is gone. They'd lived for the wrong things. At verse 21, we find out the destruction is violent. Verse 
as a millstone is thrown down, Babylon's not going to be found. Uh, verse 8 reminded us that her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning. She will utterly be burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. God is strong. He's the judge. And as we see this, we see that the future for Babylon is bleak. But what is a challenge to me is that we know the end if we believe God's word for all those who live like the world or unbelievers. But as we said before, professing Christians don't want to separate. We have professing believers wanting to be like the world. Mimicking the world, having the things of the world, having the attitudes of the world. Uh, I'm afraid that many of them aren't true believers. They've never been indwelled by the Holy Spirit and their lives changed or those desires wouldn't be there. And as they're confronted with that, many don't seem concerned at all. So their future is bleak as well. Uh, judgment is coming. And that should be a challenge to us to speak truth to those people, to challenge those people. It should be a challenge to us to evaluate our desires, our actions, to see if they're representing Jesus Christ properly. Because we want to be a bridegroom who is pure and ready for the return of Christ. Let's pray and then we will have our prayer time. God, we thank you for the study together. Help us to recognize our responsibility to live for you. Pray for those at home that they might get in the condition that they can be with us. And we pray that you would uh, just continue to challenge us in our walk. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.